Hello and welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. My name is Bill Kennedy and our special guest today is Steve Hoffman. Hey Steve, how's it going? It's great, thank you. I really appreciate taking the, the, the time to be with us for the next hour to kind of talk about your story. Before we kind of dive into that, why don't you give everybody you know, a couple of minutes of what you're doing today and, and um, that would be interesting. I am the CEO of Founderspace. It is an international startup incubator and accelerator. We operate all over the world in 22 countries. So I work with entrepreneurs, uh, software development teams. I work with venture capital, all on the process of helping projects launch and creating new businesses. And my background actually is in software development. I am an electrical computer engineer by training. I have developed a lot of products myself, developed and designed, so I know the pro process intimately, and I um, really enjoy uh, the process of taking an idea from conception all the way through the product launch. It is, you know, giving birth to the product is something that, for me, it's my passion, and I love working with really creative, dynamic teams. Yeah, that's brilliant. I'm also the author of several books, so my first book, Make Elephants Fly, is all about the process of innovation, how you create products, how you test them out, how you bring them to market. My second book, Surviving a Startup, is all about surviving a startup, basically everything entrepreneurs need to know so that they don't wind up dead at the end of the process, which happens about 90% of startups fail. And I actually wrote an even earlier book, way back, which was all on game design, because I've spent, I'm a gamer, I've designed a lot of games in my career, and I partnered with two other amazing professors who teach game design at USC, and we wrote a book called Game Design Workshop, which takes you through that whole process. Steve, you've been busy. <laughs> I have, I love creating, I love working, so for me, working is my play. Okay. Yeah. I got so many questions now. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but I, 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 I got a couple of places I want to begin. Maybe more of a personal question first. Uh, and since you're in this entrepreneurial space and helping people build companies, like our company does that too. We, we've always had this kind of motto where you can have all the ideas you want in the world, but if you don't execute on them, they're just ideas at the end of the day. Right. And I feel like Everything you've just said to me is all about making sure that that person can execute on that idea. That's exactly right. So when, when I work with teams, uh, you know, you can have the best idea in the world. A lot of people have amazing ideas. I have a million ideas a day, it feels like, that I never execute. They go nowhere. They just remain in my head. Sometimes I tell them to some people um, and they nod their heads. But uh, the difference, in I invest in startups too. So I'm an angel investor. I put money into different startups. And when I look at it, I don't just look at the idea because I see the idea as only a starting point. That The idea is where you begin. What happens next is what really matters. Because I've seen teams with incredible ideas, but the teams weren't really that good. They didn't have it together. Um, and those teams, they always fumble the ball, literally. On the execution, it, it just never comes out right. The product may launch, it may not launch, but when it launches, there's just no reaction. However, if you get a great team, a team that's really attuned to executing on a product, you have all the right ingredients, a really great designer, really great technical person, and hopefully somebody on the team who can sell, figure out where the market is, how to sell, how to reach those customers. You get that type of team together, and when they uh, execute on a product, even if they get it wrong the first time, uh, if it's a great team, they'll keep trying. They'll iterate, they'll throw out what they had, they'll start over, they'll try something different, and eventually they figure it out and those products go. I'm gonna ask you one more question before we go back into your background because I, how important do you think it is to be able to dog food your own product? Because I have tried to build product that, for others that we didn't need, and those products have failed. But when you find something that you're going to use every day because it solves a personal problem, that's where we've had success. So how important have you seen that? It depends on your mentality. A lot of people uh, dog food their own products, and I think that's a great way to start 
a, a company, uh, launch a business, because you know the needs of the customer. You are the customer. You're using it. Look at Slack, right? That whole thing was, you know, they dog fooded Slack. Look at oh, most of the great products out there. They actually came up with the idea because it was something they needed. However, it, a lot of great companies also make products for other people, not necessarily themselves. And that's harder. Like that puts up more obstacles because you don't directly have a feel for the product. Like you aren't the customer. So if you aren't the customer, it means you have to go beyond yourself. You have to get inside the head of the customer. And that is the challenge, right? Some people are really good at this. Like they are really good listeners. They can really see things from multiple perspectives. When they engage with the customer, they will start to see how that custom, what the customer's needs are. And more importantly, what the outcome the customer wants. Like, what do they want? You, the customer isn't going to design your product. Like, they, they might know they have a problem, but they, they aren't software designers. They aren't product people. They, they can't do it. They can't imagine a solution. All they can imagine is what they have today, maybe a little better. So if you're going to come up with a radical new solution, um, that's your job as the product team. You need to go to them, though, and figure out what are the outcomes they want. What do they care about? What's going to move the dial for them in their business or if they're an end user in their lives and, and really make them just insanely fall in love with what you've built? And so either path is okay, but honestly, if you know what you really need and you know there are a lot of other people out there like you, go that path. It's easier. Like you can make the product, you can use it, you can tweak it. You, you don't need to, you know, go out and spend a lot of time doing all that hard work with other people trying to figure out what they need and what they want and what they think. Yeah. I, I, I can just speak from personal experience. If I'm not the subject matter expert and I don't have one, I've learned already. I'm, I can't work on this. Like I'm not going to invest that kind of time and money on it anymore. Okay. I want to bring you, since you, you have an engineering background, and now you're this person who's helping engineers and companies um, get on the right footing, get their ideas engineered in, into market. So I, I, want to, I want to bring you all the way back. And, and as I do, um, we're going to age you a little bit because I think it's important that we have some kind of what year and, and where you are because that kind of dictates the tech that we're talking about. So I want to bring you back, and I want to hear that first experience that you can remember working on a working on a computer. What, what was that first experience? What was that like for you? Oh my God! When I first <laughs> worked on a computer, that you know, you're making me seem like a dinosaur. <laughs> I, and I don't feel like a dinosaur yet. But the first computer I worked on was when my father brought home a Commodore PET computer, the one with the chiclet keyboards. And if you remember this computer, you're, you're a dinosaur. Um, <laughs> it was the early days, you know, and my other friends, they had an Osborne computer. And I was like, wow, you can make a portable computer. It was huge by today's standards, but uh, it was portable. And, you know, those things were amazing to me. And then the trash 80s, I also worked on those. Um, so it was uh, when my father brought that home, my father, uh, you know, he was a professor at MIT. Um, he was totally into computers from an early stage. And he said, son, you know, learn computers. Everything is there are going to totally change the world. And yeah, he turned out to be right. So that had a big influence on me going into engineering, uh, computer engineering, because um, it was amazing. And what I did is what most kids do when they get their first computer is I looked for games. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had to play games. Like, what, you know, what's the use is a computer if you can't play games? And then I also started coding. So I started learning basic, uh, the programming language at the time that was pretty basic. And I went up from there. Actually, I, when I got into high school, um, they had these computers called the Monroe, which almost nobody has heard of, but they were, uh, they were there at the time and one of the first color computers actually. And I started coding games because I loved games. So I made this game, um, and it was called Star Trader and it was a business simulation game, had all my classmates hooked on that game. So I, I got an A plus plus and unfortunately several of them failed because all they did was test my game instead of coding anything themselves. But that really hooked me on software development. So that means that that computer that your dad brought home, you were, you were 
I guess in middle school, junior high school at the time. What year did you graduate high school? Just so I can put some. So I graduated class of 84. 84. Okay. I graduated 87. So we're not, we're not that far apart. All right. That's, no. that's, that's cool. Okay. So in junior high school, your dad brings home th this computer and it sounds like even though your dad's maybe pushing you a little bit, you, you, you got hooked yourself, right? You're, you're your father's son. Like you got hooked on this machine. And then in high school, you're, I, I imagine you were taking a class when you wrote that game that you had Yes. I don't remember in high school having, I guess we did have computer classes. Now I had a computer class. I took it because I wanted to learn. Now, the professor really didn't teach anything. <laughs> professor Hartley it wasn't a professor, the high school teacher, I should say. The high school teacher didn't really know how to code at all. So really what it was was time for you to sit down and teach yourself how to code. Wow. So you build this game and everybody's playing this game instead of doing their work is what you're saying. In the lab. I imagine you had it installed in all the machines in the lab. Yeah, so of course, I wanted everybody to play it. I made it. Like, <laughs> What's the fun of making a game if you can't get all your friends to play it? So yeah, That's I brilliant. got them all playing, which was to their detriment, unfortunately. When you're in high school, what other things are you interested in? Are you playing sports? Are you in other clubs? Are you music? Like, what other things are happening in your life in high school outside of this love for the computer? So I was a weird, geeky, shy kid, which is quite unusual for engineers, you know, they're usually the dashing heads of class, you know, <laughs> the popular kids on the block. You know, I, I was a classic nerd. So, uh, but in high school, but I wanted to transform myself. So like I had a mission in high school to totally transform myself. I was like a, a B minus student before I went into high school. I really was, you know, not excellent at anything. And then in high school, I said, well, I don't have to be this way. I could change. And um, as soon as I like changed my mindset, that I could, you know, get all A's, I suddenly got all A's. Like, and I was in, uh, you know, the advanced calculus class. I also signed up for three sports. So I did three sports a year. And God, was I awful at those sports. Like, <laughs> I was the, un uh, like, I went out, imagine this, I was a, 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 a tall, a lanky, super thin, a geeky kid, and I go out for the wrestling team. Well, <laughs> It was just, I figured wrestling was easier for me than football or basketball because they kind of were desperate for people. They didn't, you, know, they, you could actually get on the team. I wouldn't even get on the football or basketball team, but I could get on the wrestling team. But I got slaughtered, like literally like, you know, a pretzel tied in knots. However, I stuck it out for three years and I earned the respect of my teammates. I also played rugby. Again, it was a sport that they would take me. <laughs> and I did uh, running, track and field and cross country. So, but I, I would tell you, at all, every sport I did, I was just awful, god awful. But I did them to improve myself. Um, and, and I ended up, you know, graduating with all A's, valedictorian, because I was just a goal setter. Like, I want to achieve these goals. I'm going to set them. I'm going to do them. Even if I suck at them, even if I wind up, you know, um, I actually made varsity wrestling my final year, which was really an accident. Like the other guy screwed up and, and he touched his hands when you're not supposed to. And, um, and so I ended up winning. So <laughs> did you ever consider quitting at any given time, the sports, knowing that you were just not performing at a certain level? I never considered quitting, wow. honestly. Like after some of those wrestling, you know, one time I got knocked unconscious wrestling. Another time, almost every day, I was literally so depleted that I would go lay down on the bench in the locker room and I could not get off that bench for, to, to just to bicycle home for at least a half an hour. Like it was just completely <laughs> massacred my body. But over time I became better and better. And no, I think when you're doing anything, look, when you're, when you're doing a project, there are always times when you hit these walls, when you think it's impossible, when you want to give up and you just can't do it. Otherwise you're, you're, you know, you're going to end up with nothing. So I, I'm a very goal oriented person and I just stuck to the goal and whatever came my way, I just dealt with it. So I, I, I'm curious about your peers in high school at this time, because kids, I mean, I went to school the same time you did. When you're failing and not doing well, I mean, your peers can be pretty rough on you. I mean, how was your friends? Did you have a, were the kids a good support system? Were they challenging you? I, I'm kind of curious, the, the, the social aspect of school while you're doing all of this. Did you have that support system or did you feel like you had to fight through that too? So in, it was a lot harder for me in junior high. 
so in junior high, I was extremely shy. I was also extremely shy in high school, like really introverted and shy. So I hung out with the other geeky kids who liked Dungeons and Dragons and all the, you know, and, and I honestly didn't even try to be popular. Like, you know, you're at, at, at some people, like, you know, they have hope, like, of trying to be popular. Now, I also didn't want to be something I wasn't. Like, I just wanted to be me. So I hung out with the kids who loved games and all, all the, the, the geeky things that I loved. And I didn't mind it, but I did get bullied. And, and I decided, part of my big motivation in, in high school and joining the sports teams was I was like not going to take it anymore, right? I was not going to take anybody uh, putting me down in any way. So literally, um, I had one of those classic moments in junior high school where the kid who was bullying me, I, I just went right up to him. I slammed uh, my locker shut when he came up to me. And I said, you meet me by the railroad tracks. I'm going to bash your head in. I'll be there. And Literally, I went out to the railroad tracks. He never showed up. He didn't show up. So I didn't have to fight him. Thank goodness. Because I really wasn't a fighter in junior high. Um, but then when I went into high school, literally everything changed. Like because my attitude changed, people's reactions to me changed. I, you know, nobody bullied me, but I still wasn't the popular kid. Like I was, I was super shy. I just did my own thing and I focused, you know, I'll, I focused on a few friends that I really cared about. And, but I wasn't, I didn't try to enter the popular crowds. I didn't do any of that. I just focused on people that I liked. And I ended up having a lot of friends. Like it was actually a great experience. Like I made a lot of friends. I was sort of one of those people who didn't join a clique. I just kind of moved between different groups. Um, because I was on the sports teams, I was in kind of like the, you know, the nerdy groups and I was, I just like moved between all, you know, I did my gamer friends. I did all these different things and I had a, a good time. I can relate to that because I was very similar. I wasn't a core member of any sort of group, but I could hang with any group whenever that moment was, wherever, you know, wherever we were. But a part of me always felt like I didn't have a strong, really strong friendships because of that too in high school. Like I, there's one person that I still talk to from high school today, which maybe that's good. I mean, is there anybody from high school that you still, even if it's once a year to say happy birthday, that you still talk to? I still keep in touch with a number of people from high school. But, you know, the older you get, the harder it gets because those were, <laughs> it was such a long time ago. And I do keep in touch. And when I see them, I have really good feelings about a lot of the people who I did stuff with. I'm also, because I'm goal driven, I'm so busy now that I think that's a big reason uh, that it's, you know, I haven't invested the time into nurturing and continuing those relationships. And, you know, relationships require time. They require you to really, you know, any type of relationship, you have to invest in it. You get what you give. Uh, so I haven't uh, done enough of that. I understand how you felt like, you know, when you're transitioning between a lot of different groups, it's hard to get really deep with one group because you're not spending the time. Like you're not totally investing your identity. Like those groups are identity, right? So if you're like half in and half out, you haven't, it's not your complete identity like it is for the other people in the group where it, it, it is. And in high school, it can be like, their life. It is their life. You don't form uh, that type of relationship. Like I don't have this gang that I go and hang out with still from high school. That doesn't exist. And it's funny because I don't really have that now in my personal life. I have friends that I'll hang out with maybe once a month or, or more, right? You know, less, but I, those friends are really clicky with other people, right? I just come in and out of everybody's life and everybody enjoys when I'm around, but I'm not it's funny. I don't know why, right? Like, I guess that just carried on with me too. Yeah. And I think some of it might be our personalities, you know, how, you know, everybody's different, right? So some people really need uh, to be part of a group, like for who they are, for their psychology, for um, their own um, self-esteem um, and security. They really need, other people don't need it as much. Um, and so they tend to be much more fluid, but they don't go as deep. And I, I think, uh, a lot of it comes down not just to environment, but also just how your DNA programmed you. Let's continue the story a little bit. So while you're in high school doing all of this stuff, at some point you have to start thinking, what I try to tell my kids all the time is what you're doing today is setting you up for four years from now. Everything is like a four years sort of journey. So if you do really good things this year, four years from now, you'll be set up for the next, right? And so while you're in high school, you have to start thinking about the next four years. So 
Are you thinking at this point, as you graduate, we're taking the path of university, and do you already kind of know what you want to study? Like, what are, what are your thoughts coming in of graduating high school? And, and you were the top of your class, right? So then there's also expectations there. So talk to me about, like, the expectations you felt you had on yourself and then what you were thinking you were going to do after high school. When I graduated high school, I graduated uh, near, you know, I was valedictorian, so at the top of my class. But... You know, I put myself under a lot of pressure because I had taken like two math classes simultaneously to jump ahead a year. So I was in the super advanced calculus and I was, you know, on all the sports teams. So I was, I was working all the time. Like literally, I, I put myself under so much pressure. My father, um, he actually, he's a very wise man. So he was a professor at MIT originally. He went there at 16, but he, decided to leave MIT and move to Davis, California and become a professor at UC Davis because he felt too much pressure. He felt like he, too much competition. It was just, it wasn't good for uh, raising a family or for him. And so when he raised me, he said, um, he told me, he said, you know, it doesn't matter what university you go to. It doesn't, you know, you know at the end of the day, you're going to be whoever you are. You know, and he said, God forbid, don't go to MIT. (laughs) He goes, those were like the most brutal years of my life. And I didn't, you know, he goes, the best thing I did was when I like took a break from MIT and joined the Air Force, you know, and he got to go to the Air Force and like be a guy, you know, just be a guy. Um, and, And he worked on engineering projects, of course, but it wasn't like the pressure cooker that those universities are. And then he loved it at UC Davis, where he could just do his research and feel like he had a life. Um, so he told me, don't go to the top college. Like, it's funny because all these parents pressure their kids, you know, go to the best school you can get into, blah, blah, blah. It's going to make all the difference in your life. So he said, just go to school that you feel comfortable with. So I took his advice. Like I, because, uh, you know, he, he was really wise and I did, I decided to go to a good school, but not like I could have gotten into Berkeley or, you know, uh, probably Stanford or other places, but I didn't even try. So I ended up uh, going to UC Santa Barbara because I figured I was going to want to be the top of my class, but I could be the top of my class there and have a great time. Like <laughs> I could take weekends off. I could party. I could go to the beach. It was the most beautiful place in the world. They had a good engineering program, but I could just have an incredible time. I went there and I did like it was like paradise for me. Um and I think that was really good advice and transformational advice in my life. You know what's amazing about that, Steve, is like, I think it's the opposite for a lot of people. Like, you party really hard in high school, and then you go to university to buckle down and, and focus. And you like buckled down and focused in high school and went to university to party. <laughs> Exactly. Because I didn't party at high school. Like I just worked so hard because I was in this transformational mode. Like I was determined to achieve those goals. And then once I achieved them, I was like, I don't need to prove myself anymore. I need to have fun. Like, <laughs> like if- But you didn't like take a liberal arts degree. I mean, you went into engineering, which like is still not a joke. I mean, you still had to do work, right? It was hard. Like, yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy, put it that way. And I went in, instead of going into computer science, which I was really naturally prone to computer science, I loved creating, uh, software was so easy for me. Like, I just pick up a language, you know, overnight and learn it and, you know, but I went into electrical computer engineering because I wanted more of a challenge. And I tell you, that actually was a mistake. Because elect, the uh, electronics part was not my passion. Like, I was curious about it, but I wasn't really passionate about it. So uh, going into electrical computer engineering, I didn't like it that much. I liked the software courses I had. I loved those. And those were great. But all the electric, you know, I liked the physics because it was interesting. But uh, really, I shouldn't have done that. I should have focused on software. I know you could do the schooling. And I know you did the engineering. And I know you graduated with this double E. You're going to graduate with this electrical engineering degree. You decided to, to put that through. But you're also there to have, to also have a good time. I'm kind of curious on the good time side first. Uh, did, did you join a fraternity? What, what, what were you doing to have that, that fun? When I joined the university, one of my big goals, again, was self-transformation. But this time, transforming from the, the geeky, really uh, excellent student into the fun party guy. So that was my goal. And when I set out to do a goal, I usually do it. But 
I didn't want to join a fraternity because I don't like cliques. And I really did not, I, I never saw myself as, as a frat boy. So what I did um, was I just found my own friends and made my own fun and we formed a society and it was called the Society for the Abolition of Social Value. <laughs> and in that society, in college, we would go out and we would just do things that we never thought we would do, like we never thought we could do. So, you know, you see, you see the hot girl, you're going to go talk to her, right? You, uh, we went actually to the fraternity parties. We, uh, when they had rush, we went there. I dressed up in this crazy outfit, like this sparkly jacket jacket that looked like Michael Jackson. I put on this crazy wig with this hair going out in all directions. I I had these jeans that were covered in paint and, and ripped holes and these sandals, and I went to rush the fraternities. All the fraternity guys, like I was totally out of place because they were all very preppy. Uh, they, they were all, you know, they, they were all, uh, they all look like clones of each other. And then I come in and I say, I'm Larry. <laughs> Larry is here to, to join your fraternity. And they, and I go, Hey, dude, dude, how do I join this fraternity? And they're like, well, you know, you do need, uh, you, you, and I go, dude, what, 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 what grades do you need to get in here? And they go, Oh, well, you need a 2.0. I go, oh, dude, I can't join. I, I don't have, I don't have under a 2.0. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. And then I would, I would get on the floor with my friends and we'd do these crazy dancing and all this stuff. And it, they actually liked it. So it was really fun. Um, but I would always, uh, be pushing the limits. Um, in my dorm in the first year, you know, I'd watch the movie Animal House, where they have this incredible food fight. So uh, as part of the Society for the Abolition of Social Values, we decided we want to have a food fight. So my my roommate and I, we went everywhere putting up signs. Uh, we picked a day and then we went everywhere and we put up signs in the elevator. We put up signs on every, every you know, dorm room, every hall of every dorm. And we're putting, don't be shy, throw a pie, don't be flake, <laughs> throw a cake, join the food fight, you know, and then we put the date below it. So we could, and it was this huge cafeteria, like enormous cafeteria, you know, seating, you know, hundreds and hundreds of students, like giant. We go into the cafeteria that day, all excited because we had been promoting this food fight. Like we had been architecting it. We weren't leaving anything to chance. We go in there and suddenly we find out that the cafeteria has been cut in half. Like literally they put up partitions dividing this giant cafeteria and we walk in and it's empty. Like total, there's no, there's like a couple people sitting at the tables eating. And then we walk around the partition and the other half is packed. Like everybody's in one wow. half of the cafeteria because they all <laughs> are going for the food fight. They all read our signs and oh they are primed. And we were like, oh my God, it's going to happen. So we went up, got in line at the cafeteria. And sure enough, they're serving like these cream oh my pies. God. <laughs> <laughs> like, guys, you, you didn't read that we're having a food fight today? <laughs> and you're throwing these cream pies? Like, we just started to load up our trays oh my with goodness. pies. <laughs> and, and, and then we go to, and we sit down. And everybody like has their trays just filled with food. <laughs> everybody's sitting there and the cafeteria staff is like getting nervous like they're looking around they like everybody's on one half they didn't expect this and they're <laughs> but nobody will throw the first piece of food everybody's afraid like because they just nobody will do it so all of a sudden um one person some genius out there takes their knife and starts tinking their glass tink 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 all of a sudden it spreads everybody <laughs> Hundreds of students are tinking their glasses, tink, 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 getting louder, louder, louder. Still, nobody's willing to throw the first pie. So what I do is I take a pie and I slide it off of my tray, and at the next table over are a bunch of jocks, and I just launch it at them. Oh my god! All of a sudden, because I had to do it. Like all of a sudden, the room erupts in food. Like just like food is. Everywhere. People are throwing everything. It is just a madhouse. And then literally five minutes later, everybody dashes for the door because nobody wants to get oh. like, the point. Uh, and the, the place is like empty and just covered in food and everything. Steve. Ran. Wow, and, dude, you 
That's you. Yeah, that had so, to be surreal. It was surreal, but there were repercussions from this that I didn't realize because the school went nuts. They actually put out, they, they, uh, they wanted to uh, arrest me. <laughs> they oh, wanted no. to arrest, first of all, they wanted to arrest the person who put up the signs. And then they, for inciting a riot, a riot. <laughs> And secondly, they wanted to arrest the person who threw the first piece of food. <laughs> Both of them me. <laughs> so all of a sudden I became totally paranoid. But it was near the very end of my freshman year at college. So, but I was started like, literally, because I'd been bragging about the food fight. You know, you, I was like, hey, telling all my friends I started. You know, they all knew. They actually were coming after me. And every, everybody started to talk about, oh, they're going to put, they're going to put, they're going to get those people on inciting a riot. They had called in the police, you know. And so for the net, it was near the very end of the academic year. I only had three weeks to go. So I did everything. I started wearing sunglasses. It was just like a movie. I started to grow a beard. I was like, just completely, I was like, I just have to get through finals. If I could get through finals and get home, they won't arrest me. <laughs> We're starting this food fight. And um, luckily, the RA, um, resident assistant, on my floor of the dorm, she was, you know, she was really nice. And also, she thought I was the sweetest guy. So when they came to her and they said, you know, we think, other people have told us that Steve Hoffman started this food fight. And Steve Hoffman put up the signs. She said, no, it couldn't be him. He's too nice. He would never do that. She saved my butt because <laughs> she, she honestly believed I didn't do it. <laughs> so uh, when that last day came and I finished my last final, I jumped in my truck and I put, loaded all my stuff and took off. And I was so happy. I have felt like my whole life I've had some sort of guardian angel around me, either whispering in my ear or saving me from similar situations, right? And it feels like your guardian angel stepped in and whispered in your RA's ear. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't Steve. It wasn't Steve. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's, that's a good, I, okay. Now I really get it. Was, was this group of friends that you developed in university, it sounds like you were a, a group of friends who would challenge each other. I, I mean, I had friends like that in my life, which was really fun at the time because we would just challenge each other and you couldn't back down from a challenge, right? Like, you couldn't do that. It sounds like that's what you, this group of friends you developed were like in university. I would say um, we would challenge each other, but I was the main instigator. So I was actually putting up the challenges to them and me. Kind of, I was leading us down this unsavory path. It sounds like those four guys on TV, I can't remember their show, but they, they do all those kind of, they challenge each other with the practical jokes or something. Sounds like you, know, you could have been yes. in that group. <laughs> if YouTube was around at the time, we probably would have had a YouTube channel. <laughs> what are you thinking now after university? Because I, I think we're talking about 1988 when you, when you graduate university. Are there a lot of jobs out there for a double E major? Are you thinking you're gonna go work at Intel and start designing the next great chip? What's going on in your head now as you graduate university? When I graduated uh, with my electrical computer engineering degree, my dream was to work at Hewlett Packard because at the time, Hewlett Packard was the place to work. It was like Google of the time. So everybody wanted to work at Hewlett Packard. And I actually uh, interviewed with them and got the job. So I got that job that I wanted. But at the same time, I didn't like electrical computer engineering. So even though that was my dream company, it wasn't really any longer my dream job because I didn't want to design chips and circuits and things like that. I had really preferred coding. Uh, that was the part I liked. So I, but I wasn't going to be doing that in the job, but I had another passion. So when I had grown up as a child, um, all the way through high school, I'd made movies. I had made, uh, you know, over 50 short films and everything from animation to live action. I was just totally into doing that. And I had actually dreamed of becoming a movie director. When I was asking you other things you did in high school, you didn't tell me you were making movies in the, in the early 80s. Like the equipment you had was probably the size of my head, right? Remember those big 
Were you doing this on those big cameras with the v VHS? When I was in high school, I was committed to making Super 8 movies because the, the uh, VHS was really poor quality and the Super 8 was film, so it was pretty good. Um, so I had a whole system set up. I had an editing studio. I had turned my bedroom into kind of a movie studio, even a set at one point. I got all my friends involved as actors. I had the scripts. I did animations. I was totally into it. So I was into a lot of stuff in high school. You know, make, I made my own games. I made my own movies. I coded. I did all, you know, whatever. I love doing projects. I had always dreamed of being, you know, the next Steven Spielberg, a movie maker. But I was also practical. And I, and you know, I knew that like to get into Hollywood to make movies was like almost impossible. So the next best thing I thought I would be doing would be making games because I loved to code and it was kind of an art, it combined technology and art. So I'd always like combining technology and kind of artistic pursuits. But when I graduated college, I got this job at Hewlett Packard, which was, you know, kind of the dream company, except I didn't no longer wanted to be an electrical computer engineer. So at the same time that I applied to Hewlett Packer, I had also applied under different majors to different universities. Talk about a mixed up guy. So I had applied uh, to USC, um, the film school, uh, the top film school to make movies there. And, and then I applied to Princeton in philosophy. So I figured maybe I'll be a philosopher, maybe I'll be a movie maker, and maybe I'll be an electrical computer engineer. But I will let fate decide for me. Okay, wait, wait, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, Steve, slow down, slow down. Because we've been talking for about a half an hour, and the movie thing's just coming up, and I, I want to know at least a little bit, were you making any movies in university, especially with all the shenanigans going on? And then, where does philosophy suddenly materialize in all of this? All right, you got to give me a couple minutes here of these two questions. I have to apologize because my life is, there's, it's hard to convince, com compact my life into a podcast. So I've been leaving out stuff, but the deeper we go, the more I have to reveal. So in college, no, I just focused on, on getting good grades and partying <laughs> and, and breaking social values. But I, I've also always been into philosophy, at, at reading, at thinking, uh, you know, as a real big fan in those days of Schopenhauer, uh, he was my favorite philosopher, I guess the pessimist in me. When I graduated, I thought, you know, I could go down any of these paths. You know, I could be happy literally doing any of them uh, at the end of the day because, you know, you, I believe that people could, I'm interested in all sorts of things. And, you know, if, as long as it's interesting, as long as it's challenging, I could get excited about it. So, um, but I really was a dreamer. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to go to Princeton and study philosophy there? That would just be an amazing experience. So I applied. Like, instead of saying, no, I won't do that because that has nothing to do with my degree and nothing to do with anything else, I just applied. I didn't get in, so I didn't go to Princeton. However, I did get accepted to USC Film School, and I did get my dream job at Hewlett Packard. And that was a really tough choice. Like, I didn't, like, one was, like, I'd get great money, and it, it was a great company, and I could have this uh, really solid career. And the other one is I'd go off and make movies and probably be unemployed. <laughs> like, most filmmakers out there, like, the chance of being a Steven Spielberg is so small. But I chose that path. So I went to film school because I thought, well, this is my chance. I can, I can do this. And it was another amazing experience. Really great. I got to make a lot of films in film school. And then um, I graduate film school, and of course, when you graduate film school, nobody's lining up to hire you. It's not like there's movie studios. You're just a film student. They don't care about you in Hollywood. Hollywood is about who you know, and you really only know other film students and some professors. Um, so I literally didn't know what to do, but I didn't want to just accept that fate. I didn't want to just say, oh, okay, now I can, you know, I graduated film school, I'll go get that job at Hewlett Packard. So what I did was I got a list of all the top producers and heads of studios in Hollywood, a, literally a list of their contact information. And I wrote each of them a letter. And in, and in that letter, it was really short. I joked around about my graduating film school. I said I would do anything to get in their company please, please interview me. Out of 150 letters that I sent out, I got 
three responses. Three. So I had my master's in film and I got three responses. The first response was a phone call from the producer of Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> Star Wars series. And I was huh? just like blown away. I was like, oh my God, he called me. And the first thing he said was, you know, I really liked your letter, but I don't have a job for you. I just wanted to talk to you and say hello. So we talked and I was like really nervous. And I didn't know what to say. Like he didn't have a, it wasn't an interview. He was just chatting with me. So we chatted, had a great conversation and he hung up. No job. Now I have two more shots at this before I strike out. The second shot was Disney. So Disney actually calls me up and they, the head of their studio invited me in to work in their movie studio. So I go into Disney and, and, and I sit down, we're talking, it's, and, this uh we're going back and forth and they asking me all these questions it seems like it's going really well and then they ask me what is the hardest question they could have possibly asked me they said do you watch disney movies and and i said you know in those days most disney movies were kids movies like in those days so of course I didn't watch those. And I was at film school. So I was studying Godard and Fellini and all these like, you know, master filmmakers. And, and I, I didn't, wasn't really that interested in Disney movies, but I couldn't lie. So I said, no, I actually, you know, don't watch them. And then they asked me, well, what type of movies do you like? And so I started listing off movies like Apocalypse Now and Clockwork Orange and all these <laughs> movies. Yeah, complete anti-Disney 1990, right? right? 1990. Opposite. <laughs> I saw the expression on the on her face, the director of development for Disney, <laughs> totally drop. Like literally drop. The meeting was over. She had decided when I opened my big fat mouth that I was not a fit for Disney. And literally, we talked a little bit more, but it, I, I had blown it. Like, it was over. I was out the door. Let me ask you a question. If you could go back in time and be back in that moment, would you start talking about how, you know, Peter Pan is your favorite movie? And I have learned a little bit about sales. <laughs> and what I would have to do in order not to lie would be to harken back to my childhood and talk about all the Disney films that I loved when I was a kid. Like, and how much influence they had over me and sort of skirt the question of, do I watch Disney films today? That's how I would have answered. But I didn't know that at the time. And I, I was pretty naive. I thought, well, she would respect me for liking these great films. But that's not how it worked in the job interview, at least with her. So now two out of three strikes. I have one shot left, one shot. And I get invited um, into a company called Freeze Entertainment. It was spelled F-R-I-E-S. It was literally this building with the big name Freeze on the top across from the Man Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And I walk into the office and the office is like, a, it's a beautiful office. It's like all the, the Chuck Freeze, who is the head of Freeze Entertainment, all his uh, tr Academy, you know, he, he, won, he didn't win Academy Awards. He won Emmys because he did a lot of stuff for television. So all his Emmys were on the shelf. It was this enormous office. He was at the desk at the end. It, it looked literally like something out of, uh, have you seen the movie Barton Fink? So it looked literally something like out of Barton Fink. No. Um, so I walked in there and Chuck was this big old fashioned Hollywood guy. And he had produced the Martian Chronicles, which I was a big fan of, luckily. <laughs> and a lot of other like TV miniseries and movies, like over 150. And he looked at me and he says, what do you want? And I was like, I want a job. <laughs> What do you want to do? <laughs> I want to be a writer and director. That's, you know, I went to USC film school. I got my master's degree. This is my passion. Give me a chance. Ah, let me think about it. So that was my interview. That was it. Five minutes. <laughs> Literally. Like, it was really short interview. So I go away, and I'm waiting to hear back. You know, the weeks roll on. And then all of a sudden, the office calls. His, his assistant calls and said, come on in. We have a job for you. So I come in, I'm super excited. And then they introduce me to the director of development in their company. And my job is to read scripts, literally to read scripts and write synopses of the scripts. So it wasn't my dream job because, but it was a first job, a first step in Hollywood. So they load me up with these scripts and I'm supposed to read them as fast as I can. Um, and then write a synopsis and get it right back to them so that they can decide if it's worth their time to actually read the script. 
So my job is to tell them, is this script worth reading? Is, or, is, or did you just waste your time? You're basically writing the cliff notes, right? I am writing the cliff notes for all these screenplays and, and trying to get them and then giving a short recommendation at the end. Yes, you should actually read this. This would make a good television movie or forget it. You know, this isn't worth your time. And 98% of them weren't worth their time. So <laughs> I, what it means is you read a lot of god-awful scripts, a lot of them. You were the front door. I mean, if I had a script there, you were the person I needed to take out for a steak dinner and some whiskey, right? I was. You needed to bribe me, except you didn't know who I was. You only knew the development director. You didn't know that the readers, all the readers out there. I mean, I mean you, you had real power there, Steve. I mean, when you think about it, right? Actually, I did. The readers have a lot of power because they are the first door. They screen all these things. How, so if you want to get into Hollywood, find a reader, <laughs> make sure they get your script. So it's reading, but readers get paid nothing. You get paid a pittance. Like you literally, you know, get enough money to buy a pizza off reading a script and writing a whole synopsis, which takes a lot of time. And for me, it took an enormous amount of time because I was dyslexic. So I literally, my reading speed was really, really slow. <laughs> so it was like so much work. So, but I, I did the best job I could possibly do. Let me, let me ask you a question before, before you move on. Because you said it took, them, took three weeks for them to call you back. And I'm kind of curious what you did in those three weeks. Were you starting to get depressed? Were you starting to think you had to change direction? Three weeks is a long time. It's almost a month. Uh, yeah. In those, th in those three weeks between the time I got the job of the reader and I was you know, waiting for a job, I was just like, fine. I was like, this is Hollywood. Like it's, I knew it would be really hard to break into Hollywood. I knew, you know, and I'm just going to wait. And if I have to send out another 150 letters, I'll send them out. You know, whatever it takes, I'm going to figure this out. So I wasn't worried. I have to ask you this. I, I was really curious how you afforded to go to the to film school and how are you affording to live those three weeks? Are you working some sort of job while you're, all this is happening as well? I could afford to go to film school for two reasons. Number one, my parents were really nice. <laughs> they, they ended up helping support me. Number two, I did get a scholarship for writing. So I'd written this short screenplay that won a scholarship and that gave me money. And then the third is in film school, I was working in the admissions office. So I would earn free credits as well as get paid to, to work in the admissions office, accepting people into the school, reviewing all the applications. So I had all these things that helped support me through film school. But in, once I graduated, I had stopped working at the admissions office. I n had no more scholarship money. So I was really uh, just living off of what my parents would give me <laughs> until I got a job because I really didn't have a choice. Got it, I got it, okay. Uh, how long are you at this company? How, how, much, how far did you progress? Because at the end of your story, you're like an engineering and, and you're doing this. Like, this is wild to me because you're in the movie the movie industry. So what happens to your career here? Do you, I'm, yeah, I'm not even going to ask questions. I got to hear it. <laughs> this is a really crazy story. So after two weeks of reading scripts, like I'd been working two weeks, I decided I'm better than this. I didn't go get my master of fine arts degree from USC, the top film school to read scripts for other people. I got them to write scripts and make movies. So what I did was, um, I wrote Chuck Freeze the head of the company, the CEO of the company. And I said, this, uh, I have been working for you for two weeks. This is the chutzpah I had. I've been working for you for two weeks. I think you could see that I have done a good job. I would like an opportunity to really prove myself. Well, I wait. So uh, another week goes by um, and, and then another week and I'm waiting and I'm continuing to read scripts. And then he calls me into his office. And I like, wow, I've been here a month and I get called into Chuck Freeze's office again. Uh, so I go into his office. I sit down and Chuck is this big, imposing guy, super like, uh, it's, uh, very big, <laughs> a giant, chubby guy. And he was like, Hoffman, what is it? You're not happy here? <laughs> I was like, Chuck, I'm happy. I love it. But I can do so much more for you. Like, please, let me be a writer. I don't just want to read. Hoffman, come on, you've only been working here a few weeks. What are you thinking? Chuck, please, <laughs> just give me a shot. Ah, go away, Hoffman. So I go away. <laughs> and I go back to reading scripts. And I'm waiting. And then 
I get a call from his assistant, who's like this bulldog woman, the guardian of, of, you know, protecting everybody from bothering him. And she's like, she's like, Steve, Chuck has a job for you. Go in and talk to Butch. Now, Butch is Chuck's son. So Butch is um, Chuck's older son. And he is, uh, he is the man in the office who I see in the hallway who never smiles. He's always grimacing. And he is the head of their legal department. He has a law degree. So I go in and talk to Butch. And he is a bitter man. He is actually very unhappy with his life. He's very unhappy having to work for his father, that he couldn't make it on his own in Hollywood. And he's very unhappy that he's stuck in legal. And he tells me that. I don't like being in legal. You know, I wanted to make films, you know. And here I am, this young kid, you know, much younger than him, who's like pushing to do more. And so he was like just really, he didn't like me. But his father had foisted him upon, I foisted me upon him. And so he, he says, okay, take this. And he gives me this book, and it's a big book about Francis Parkman. And he tells me in this, this book that I should synopsize the whole book and make a miniseries out of it. Basically a synopsis for the actual miniseries on this book. And Francis Parkman was this explorer who went west. Really amazing story. So I take it. I work like crazy on it. I write the whole outline for the miniseries. Just what I wanted to do. I turn it in. I wait. You know, you're always waiting. <laughs> and then they call me in. Butch calls me in. And, and he actually smiles at me. He smiles and he goes, Steve, you did a really good job on this. This is an excellent job. And, and then I go, thanks, Butch. And he goes, I'll give you more work like this to do. You are now an official researcher. So now I was a researcher and a reader. But what do I do? As soon as I got that compliment from Butch, I write Chuck another letter. Because I got that. Steve's always pushing, pushing the limit. He's pushing the line. He's pushing, pushing, pushing. <laughs> So I write Chuck and I said, Chuck, Butch loved the, the synopsis of the <laughs> miniseries that I wrote for him. You know, you can see now that I can write. I can do so much more for you. And I wait. And then a week later, Chuck calls me in. And I go into his big office. I sit down. I'm starting to get to know Chuck now. He's like, Offman, I gave you a promotion <laughs> just a couple weeks ago. What is it now? <laughs> I go, Chuck, I don't want to be a, just a researcher. I want to be a writer, Chuck. I told you that. I want to write screenplays. Can you give me a job writing something? <laughs> Hoffman, don't you ever give up. I'll see what I can do. Go away. So then. That's amazing. I go back. And because I don't have a research project, I have to go pick up more scripts from the director of development. I pick up scripts. I take them. Oh, and Chuck also gave me one special project. He gave me The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he said, Hoffman, I want you to finish this entire book in the next few days and give me a synopsis of whether this could be a great movie. And The Hunchback of Notre Dame, I don't know if you've ever read it. A huge book, right? But I'm like determined. Like, this is the final test. Like, I'm going to conquer this. But I'm dyslexic, too. So I'm just like trying to read and synopsize the whole thing as fast as I can. It was literally as, it was really, really hard. I could not read the book. I didn't have time. So I could kind of scan it. But I got it done and I got a coherent synopsis. I sent it to him and I waited. Then I go, you know, I don't hear anything for the next week or two. I'm just waiting. And then I go back into the office to pick up my next batch of scripts. And I walk in uh, to my boss, the develop my technical boss, the development director. Um, and I'm like... Uh, okay, I'm here to pick up my scripts. And she looks at me and her face is, it, it's like, it's, it's grim. It, her face is like so tight and so taut and so much negative energy is pouring out of her. And she looks into my eyes and she says, Steve, you got me fired. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? And she stands up and she rushes out of the office, like just pushes past me out of the office. And I'm left standing there in her office when she is not there. And I don't know what she's talking about. And then Chuck's assistant comes in and says, Chuck wants to talk to you now. And I go into Chuck's office and it's starting to dawn on me what happened. And I sit down and I'm like, hi, Chuck. And he goes, Hoffman, you're the new development director. You're in charge now. <laughs> 
I was like, oh my God, this is what, two months in? Yeah, two months in. And, wow. and I was like, what are you talking about, Chuck? I didn't want the job of development director. I wanted to be a writer. Now, that's what I'm thinking. I didn't say this. <laughs> I'm thinking like, what are you talking about? Like, this is crazy. I didn't want to get my boss fired. She was, you know, a nice person. I like, I wanted you to hire me as a writer. But he was like, he was like, so go, go get working Hoffman. That was it. I walked back into the office and I'm like, just in a daze. Like I, it was like the movie swimming with sharks. It was exactly like swimming with sharks, except I was sort of naive. I wasn't trying to, I was just trying to better myself, not stab anybody in the back. But here I was, she got fired. I'm in her office. And honestly, I don't know what the hell a development director does. I have no idea what she does. All I knew is that she handed me scripts. Like literally that's all I knew about the job. I wanted to be a writer. I knew how to write. I didn't know how to do this job. And so I'm standing there, I go to the, her window, and I look out, and there's the Man Chinese Theater, Hollywood Boulevard with all the stars, and it was just like so surreal. I didn't know what to think. And then the phone rang. The phone starts ringing. And I'm like, I don't know, should I answer the phone? Like, it doesn't feel like it's my phone. It still feels like it's my boss's phone. Like, it's ringing. But eventually I pick it up, and I pick up the phone, and I'm like, uh, hello, Freeze Entertainment. And then they ask for her, of course, because everybody, were, and it's one of the big Hollywood agencies, ICM, one of the big agencies. They're like, oh, blah, 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 blah. Can we send over this script to you? And I'm like, yeah, sure, send it. <laughs> and I hung up. And then I go, and I don't know what to do. And I'm, I sit down at her desk. <laughs> I don't know what she does. I literally don't know what a development director does. And I'm like, I'm going to get fired. Like, he fired her and she was doing a good job and like hires me and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Like, this doesn't make any sense. So all of a sudden the readers start to come in. The other readers who had seen in the hallway and we chat and we form like little acquaintances with the other readers and they go, what are you doing behind her desk? What are you doing there? And some of these readers had been working there for years. Like one of them had been working there seven years, you know, and I just started and I was like sitting behind her desk and I'm like, well, I'm the new development director now. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> and then they go. And then they go. Oh, oh! You're the new development director. They were just totally confused. <laughs> like they didn't know what the hell was going on, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. And 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 then they go. Well, aren't you going to give me my script? And I go. Where are they? <laughs> because they knew more about oh it than I god. did. I'm like, really? so they start telling me what to do. Like, give me the scripts and which, which script, how many scripts they normally get, and you know all this stuff. And I was in this job. But the, the bizarre thing was, every single day, I felt like, you know, the imposter syndrome? It was before that term was popular, but I was an imposter. Like, I literally didn't know what I was doing at that job or why Chuck hired me. And so Chuck hires me, and uh, then he brings me into my first development meeting. Like, I'd never been in a development meeting. And it was with him and his other son, his younger son, uh, Chris, who was his younger son there. And Chris... Uh, was really nervous in front of his father because his father's this big imposing Hollywood producer like this like you know you know this guy and this and he's really tough and he must have been a tough father so Chris is like more nervous than I am and I don't know what the hell I'm doing and I don't know why I'm there and I'm sure I'm gonna get fired but he's even more nervous the son so that calmed me down a bit but we're sitting there and then they start talking about actors and actresses and who should be in what part and this this project they're working on and I'm keeping quiet because honestly, I'd never read the Hollywood Reporter. Like I just scanned it. I never read Variety. I never paid attention to who, what actresses were acting in anything. So I knew nothing about the business of Hollywood. All I knew was about what I wanted to write <laughs> in some bizarre art films. <laughs> That's like all I knew. I didn't really know the business. So I'm sitting there and then Chuck turns to me and goes, Hoffman, you know, what, who do you think we should cast in this role? And all of a sudden, like, I don't know these actors. I'm not one of these encyclopedias of all these different actors and actresses in Hollywood that they would even put in this role. And I don't even watch television because I, you know, I've always been goal focused, too busy. So I don't know what to say. So I'm totally paralyzed. And then I start to think and I th say, Chuck, let me get back to you on that. Let me get back to you. Okay, Hoffman, get back to me on it. So the meeting concludes. <laughs> I go to my office and... <laughs> And I'm like, shit, you know, I need to come up with like, how do I do this? And then I remembered my brother's 
best friend, one of his best friends, is in Hollywood. He's this aspiring director who can't get a job, or can't you know do anything. But he's a, literally he's an encyclopedia of everything called uh, everything Hollywood. He knows every A-list actor, B-list actor, C-list actor, every movie ever made, ever made, every TV show ever made. He knows everything. Like about Hollywood. So I literally call him up because they didn't have the internet in these days. I couldn't look up any of these people. So I literally call him up and I say, hey, Sean, you know, we have this film. Here's the description of the film. Who should I cast in this? And he's like, oh, and this is the guy who should have had my job. He was like, oh, you should, you could have her or her or her. Oh, these three would be great. So I go, oh, okay, thanks. So the next day we get called back into the development meeting and Chuck looks at me and goes, Hoffman, have you thought about it? Who should we cast? <laughs> and I go, well, you could have this actor. This would be my first choice. This would be my second choice. This would be my third choice. He looks at me. Hoffman, you're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this makes his son feel even more insecure. Like he's <laughs> Because everything I did in that job, even though I was sure I would be uncovered and fired any minute, everything I did, Chuck thought was brilliant. And I... <laughs> So I would just like, I would just basically wing it. I won't go into any more detail, but basically every day I had to figure out how to do this job. And every day I learned a little more until by, you know, after, after like eight months, you know, I felt comfortable. I knew the job. Chuck loved me. His son hated me, but I was, <laughs> I was doing the job. I'm going to interrupt you for a second because I, I see it differently and I see it as a skill that people need to have today. You had a network of people. You had a network of resources. You didn't give up. You make that phone call. You get a good answer. You go do this, and you get a good answer. You, right, right, you know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't luck, right? Like, why didn't his son have the same network you had of people to ask, right? Like, I feel like sometimes you just put your ego aside, and you said, I need help here. Help me. Yeah, so really, I couldn't have done it uh, without Randy. <laughs> that's, my, that's my encyclopedia. And then also... Uh, without just being persistent, like you, you, in order, I think, to grow as a human being, you have to put yourself in situations where you think you're going to, you're going to sink, like you're not going to be able to swim. And in those situations, you have to learn to swim. You literally, <laughs> you have no choice. So I literally, I just work like crazy and I learned the business of Hollywood. I started reading Variety and the Hollywood Reporter every day. I started watching television. <laughs> I started doing like everything I could do to educate myself so that I could actually do a decent job at this thing. And then once I'd figured it out, I became bored. So like I had been there literally um, a year and I was like, I could do more than this. I actually wanted to be a writer, like a director, or I'd wanted to make computer games. I really didn't want to be a development director. It was never really what I wanted to do. I did it because like I was thrust into this, but against my will and, and, and I was doing well, but I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be creative. So I basically, I went to Chuck, uh, basically in the company, one of the producers in the company, I found out his, uh, his cousin, was the founder of Sega, the big Japanese game company. And at the time, they had just passed Nintendo to become the number one game company in the world, you know, in the early 90s. And so he, I said, hey, you know, I want to move to Japan. I would love to live in Japan. And I've always dreamed of making computer games for a big game company. Can you get me a job there? And he goes, well, let me introduce you to my cousin. So he sends me over to his cousin. I talked to the cousin about all my ideas about games and, and the design ideas I have. And he's the chairman of the company. He's a U.S. He's, a, he's an American, but it's a Japanese company because he's there after World War II. Sega stands for service games on the basis. And he basically said, I will get your job in our headquarters designing games. We want to hire somebody from Hollywood to come over to our Japanese headquarters. So I was like, oh, my God, another dream coming true. I can do this. So I go into Chuck. And I say, Chuck, I'm quitting. Chuck looks at me. He's like, Hoffman, you can't quit. <laughs> you can't do it, Hoffman. You got a big career in Hollywood. <laughs> You're just getting started. And I go, Chuck, you know, I got this chance to go to Japan, and I think games are going to be bigger than movies. I honestly believe that. You know, the games are getting, there's, it's only a matter of time. And he's like, whatever. Ah, what am I going to do without you? And, and I look at him. And my brother at this time has moved to Hollywood. 
and he wants to be a music producer, but he's working in a record store. <laughs> so he has no hope of being a movie producer. He has not, you know, he's getting paid minimum wage. And I turn to Chuck and I t say, Chuck, Chuck, you could hire my brother. He looks at me. What experience does he have? Oh, he doesn't have any experience. He's working in a record store. But he's another Hoffman? <laughs> we'll hire him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, literally, I land my nepotism, I land my brother in my job, and I take <laughs> off for Japan to make games. And <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Okay, I want to get to where you are today. And these are amazing stories, right? You're somebody I got to have like three shows with here. But let's move a little quicker here. And so you, you go and move to Japan and you start working with, this, with Sega, doing game development. Is that what happens now? I was hired in Sega to be the resident gaijin, which means gaijin means foreigner in Japanese. So they wanted a different perspective on what games to make of the future. And they really wanted to make more cinematic games. So they had been coming out with Virtua Racer and Virtua Fighter. Those were their big games. They had Sonic the Hedgehog. These are kind of their hits, and they wanted to make more big things. So I was put in a group, and we were actually working with Michael Jackson. And we were making like this movie animated theme ride, like for an amusement park, with Michael Jackson. Um, and it was called Megalopolis. And it was, you know, and I got to meet Michael Jackson. It was just really fun, really amazing time. I was working there. Had a great time, um, but you know, being the foreigner in a Japanese company is a really weird thing. So, you know, they would all come to me and they would say, like, Steve, you know, Steve, what do you think of this? What, you know, uh, what do you think of this idea? And then I would tell them my personal opinion, which you know is just my personal opinion. But when I said it, it had the authority that all Americans feel this way. So if I liked it, wow. all America will love it. <laughs> If I hated it, no, Americans will not like this. <laughs> so You had the pulse of America as far as they were concerned. Yeah, I was the American designer in this Japanese game company, um, you know, and, and an idea creator. So I was this idea machine in their company. And then I was coming up with all these crazy ideas. And most of my ideas were too weird. They just didn't like them. They, they weren't commercial. Like the artist Gaudi, I wanted to do a Gaudi game because he has all these crazy designs and stuff. And they just thought they didn't understand. And so I worked there a year to cut a long story short. I worked there a year and then I got restless again. Like after every year I get restless. And so I was like, I need to start my own game company. I can't work for this big company. Like I want to make my games. And so I literally, um, I literally uh, quit again. <laughs> I quit, but I knew I couldn't start my game company in Japan because I, you know, I learned to speak Japanese while I was there, but Jap Japan at that time, very hard to be entrepreneurial, even today, much harder than Silicon Valley. So I moved back to San Francisco, Silicon Valley. And when I was, um, and, and then I started my own game company. What year, what year is this, Steve? Well, then you moved back, 93, 94? Yeah, it's, it's uh, 94. So I moved back in 1994 to Silicon Valley, determined to start my own game company, do all those projects that I couldn't do in, in Japan, but I've learned a lot. And I dusted off my coding gloves and started coding away. And literally uh, came up, you know, it took me, uh, it took me six months to code my first game. And I had no money, oh, just whatever savings I had. So I hired a few artists. My wife worked with me. What tech were you using to code the games here in 94? Is this C, C++ frameworks? Is it something? Uh, we should have been using C, but I didn't really study computer science. I studied electrical <laughs> computer engineering. So I didn't know C++. <laughs> I didn't know object-oriented language. So we actually, uh, I ended up coding it in the easiest language I could, which was Visual Basic. And if you recall Visual oh, Basic, you could, yeah. but I decided I would make a game that uh, I would actually take that idea that I had in high school, the one that all the kids were addicted to in my room, and I, it was called Star Trader then. I came up with a new name for it called Gazillionaire, and it was this intergalactic trading game where you trade products between all these planets called Gazillionaire, and it's a long story. I won't go into detail now. I will just say I launched that game. It did really, really well, and I just kept making more and more games. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. You're using Visual Basic for this, and, and the two questions I have is, I'm guessing because of the type of game it was, VB was performant enough for that game to look and feel 
solid. And then when you said distribute it, what do you mean? I just, I, I don't know how you distribute a game in 94. Uh, and neither did I. Like I knew zero, zilch. The <laughs> internet was literally, it was BBS, bulletin boards, right? Um, and so I was there at the, the, it was the very beginning. And I was like, I knew nothing about making games. I did, wasn't even that good a coder because I literally had stopped kind of coding. I did only a couple things in college. And I, I didn't know how to code that well, but I was determined. So I was going to learn Visual Basic. I figured it out. It wasn't that hard. Um, I also, I could animate and draw stuff. So I drew all the pictures myself and my wife colored them in using Kai's power tools and Adobe Photoshop. And we literally made this game that even uh, when we launched it, it looked outdated. <laughs> It looked, Gazillionaire looked outdated even for the time of 1994. And we, we cobbled this together in six months. We put it out there. We didn't know how to launch it. But the floppy disks were around, right? They, it, so basically, all the game came on all these floppy disks. So I made a shareware version. I put a shareware version up on all these bulletin boards. And then if they wanted the full version, they literally had to mail me. It was the days when you would mail in a check or cash to me. I would cash that and we would put this, the, all the floppy disks in an envelope and mail it to the person. So we waited. My wife and I worked six months like crazy on this. And then we waited. We uploaded the shareware to the bulletin boards and we were waiting. We were sitting there. And all of a sudden, we get our first check. Our first check arrived. And who is this first check from? It is from none other than Lord Gek. Now, Lord Gek. <laughs> was the biggest game geek you will ever see. Like if you had, if you have an image in your mind of what a game geek looks like, this is Lord Gek. <laughs> and so not only did we get uh, the money from Lord Gek, we said, come over to our house. We want to meet you. <laughs> you are the first person to buy our game. So we became friends with Lord Gek. Lord Gek came over. We had him to our house. We showed him the game. We gave him the floppy disks. <laughs> he was in the Bay Area. He took the games home and he played them and he loved them. Um, we started making sales over these BBSs of people sending us in cash and checks and, and we were making money. And then, but my dream was to get a big publisher and we were calling, trying to get through to the big publishers, but I didn't know anybody. I worked for Sega in Japan, but I didn't know anybody in the U S and the biggest publisher at the time was Microprose Spectrum Holobyte. So Microprose, you know, you're familiar with civilization and all these games. Uh, that was the company and they, uh, had just brought on a new CEO from Mattel. His job was to make that company big. So they had spent millions of dollars on the Star Trek franchise. So they were making Star Trek. That was their big game of the time. But Star Trek was shipping late. They couldn't get it out. So they needed to pick up another title. And just by chance, our little game had been downloaded by the QA team at Microprose Spectrum Holobyte. They had downloaded the game and they became hooked on it. Because the gameplay, even though the graphics were crude, everything was really crude, the gameplay was really uh, good. I had tested this out in high school after all. It was my high school testing group. I knew the game, right? And I'd only made it better. Um, so they were totally hooked. So the CEO brings me in um, and I was determined to own all the rights to my product. Like I, you know, a lot of these game publishers, they want to own everything. They want to own sequel rights. They want to own as much as they can own. And what leverage does an indie developer have? Like, I didn't have any leverage, but I was determined. So I was like, no, I want to own the sequel rights because you guys may just sit on the game. You may kill it. And, and if you don't do anything with it, I don't want my game to die. I want my game always to be out there. It means too much to me. So we started negotiating with him. And literally, I figured out during those negotiations that they let slip that they were late on the Star Wars shipment and they needed to close a deal by December. As soon as that information was implanted in my brain, I had leverage, right? So literally, the, that CEO was pulling out his hair. He was like, oh my God, I'm developed. Like, this guy is asking for everything. So I literally asked for everything. Like, I, we got a great advance against royalty, like, you know, 80K, which in those days was just like a ton of money. Um, in those days, it was like, and we literally got all the sequel rights, every other right, you know, um, we could, we, after like a year, we could release our own sequel and actually compete with them. And they got committed to putting it in all the retail shops, which is the big thing at the time, everywhere across the country. But we kept all the foreign rights and we could go international with it. I negotiated everything. We got it all. We literally got it all. Um, he, uh, they just handed it because they needed to ship the game. So they shipped the game. The game went out into the marketplace. And honestly, uh, 
uh, the, the reviewers went crazy over the game. They were like, they were like, we started getting like these amazing reviews, even though the game was outdated the day we shipped it, the day we made it, like it was not the high tech, cool, like Star Trek they were making. The gameplay was really, really addictive. And so all the reviewers like were giving it like five stars and all these things. And they actually, it made Spectrum Hallbite look bad because when they, sh they called me in and they were actually complaining that Star Trek, when they finally launched it, wasn't getting as good a reviews as we were getting. <laughs> <laughs> and our game was supposed to be like this nothing game that just filled a gap so that they could get, so that they could book some revenue. Basically, they Amazing. could ship out the game Amazing. and book revenue. And that was all we were for. They didn't really care about the game. So, um, but the game did really well. We got all the rights back. In fact, the game is still selling today on Steam. Like you can go get the same That's amazing. crude gazillionaire. Uh, we upgraded it actually. We made it uh, better, but it's still the same, exactly the same gameplay. And you know, we just went on making games. So we made Zapitalism after that, another business simulation game where you run a company in this world called Zapinalia. So it's basically capitalism with a Z, Zapitalism. So in Zapitalism, you run a retail store. In Gazillionaire, you basically run a trading operation, an intergalactic trading operation. Um, they're fantasy games, but they have real world business principles. So uh, they are really solid. And we made Zapitalism as a sequel to Gazillionaire, and then we made Profitania, which is where you run a factory and actually have to manufacture the goods. So we kind of had the whole ecosystem of capitalism in these three games. And the games became extremely popular with schools. We designed them just for fun. We designed them so that anybody who wanted a fun game to play could play them, but they actually, uh, schools picked them up, and middle schools and high schools and even universities, uh, picked them up and started using them to teach kids. So they had their initial life as a game, as an entertainment product. They became very popular. And a lot of uh, parents then started using them to their kids and their kids grew up with these games and now they're giving them, because the games have been around so long, their kids' kids are using them. <laughs> All of this because you went out into the bulletin boards and said, I'm gonna sell these games. And this whole roller coaster of events gets you to this it's crazy amazing. Okay. So here, here's the thing, Steve. I need another episode with you okay. because just, we're, I feel like we're only even like halfway through this story. We're only in 1994. We haven't even got to my other companies. <laughs> and I've done a lot of them. I hate to tell you. <laughs> I don't. So this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to close this uh, first podcast down right now because we're, we're a little bit over an hour. And then we're going to have you back as soon as possible. To, to finish this story because I think there's a lot of people out there that are wondering, should they stay employees? Should they start their own business? And if they do, there's a path. And I really want you to talk to that path because some interesting themes for me have kind of popped up. You've been persistent. When you've wanted something, you've asked for it. You've asked for it in, in the right ways, right? And I want to explore that a little bit more. And you took chances and you put yourself out there and good things have happened. And I want to hear more of that. And I think that's going to help a lot of people who are kind of on this fence of trying to figure out if they want to be an entrepreneur or not and how to start that. And so we're going to end this now. <laughs> and then we're going to have you back for for the next round uh, that right. everybody can hear. All right. Okay. So I really appreciate your time My for pleasure. this podcast. All right. So this is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast. Thank you for sharing time with me and Steve today. And We'll have Steve back on the next version.